And there are a lot of things in the Bible that have become euphemisms for things in our culture and in our time. Like if I call, if I call a woman a Jezebel, she's probably going to go home not very happy. <laughs> if you call somebody a Philistine, probably means they're acting uncivilized or being crude. If you, if you, if you call something, some, a town Sodom and Gomorrah, obviously it means they're full of wickedness. Or if you call somebody a Pharisee, you're probably calling them out for being a hypocrite. But we get to a passage in Luke today where Jesus uh, has some harsh words for the Pharisees, as he does in several places in the Gospel. He, he is especially hard on the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And there are many reasons for that. It seems like on the surface that the Pharisees were hard on others, but easy on themselves, offered little, offered little hope for sinners, and were hypocritical in that they cared about appearances and what's on the outside rather than what's going on inside. They had fallen into the trap of religion without relationship. See, religion without a relationship with God can be very toxic. It can be pointless. It's going through the motions. And we, we see it a lot of places. I think, I think that's one of the things that maybe the church might be seeing a little bit less of since we've, our culture has gotten away from cultural Christianity. That's kind of like where everybody identifies as a Christian and everybody goes to church occasionally, you know, because their parents and grandparents were Christian and they still identify as that. They still show up for Easter and Christmas and maybe a few other times and go through the motions, but lack the relationship with God, lack being filled with his presence and lack the joy. But when... But when Jesus lays into the Pharisees, it's something we should pay attention to because every one of us can fall into the same trap, especially those of us that are in leadership at church, whether you're a pastor, deacon, Sunday school leader, children's teacher, any, any of those types of things. If you've been a Christian a long time, you can fall into the traps of the Pharisees. And the Bible gives us a lot of examples. Are the many heroes of our faith? You know, it said the Bible shows them warts and all. It shows, it shows their mistakes. It shows the way that they've screwed up and not pleased God so that we too can learn from their mistakes. Even the esteemed 12 apostles, well, they, they get it wrong sometimes. And need to be corrected by Jesus, but the Pharisees, the Pharisees more than anybody, just are getting it wrong in a lot of ways. And we're going to look at some of those ways as Jesus sets them straight this morning. Let's look at Luke chapter 11, verse 33. No one, when he, this is Jesus talking, no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. So Jesus is stating the obvious. Whoever lights a lamp doesn't put it under something, but puts it out for all to see. It was different than our experience. We have... We have less lamps nowadays and more built-in lighting. Especially, the it seems the newer the home, the more lights you have. A lot of older houses don't even have a light in some of the bedrooms. But sometimes you have to plug in a, a pole lamp. 
so that it so that it can be lit up properly. But think about think about in the first century, they didn't know what electricity was. There were no built-in lights in the house, so you had you had to have a lantern. Either you'd take it room to room or you'd have it in each room. So most of us don't play with lanterns that much unless you go camping. And when you go when you go camping and you like your lantern, whether you like your lantern or you have a battery lantern, you put it up high so that it lights everything up. You don't tend to leave it on the ground. And of course you don't put stuff on top of it. But what what is the light? The light, as Jesus is speaking in a metaphor here, the light is his teaching and the light is the love of God. So he's saying you don't it's not something that we hide. The lamp of the body is the eye. The eye like lets light into our body. You go like this, you cover your eyes. It's all darkness. So without without the eye, you can't see light. You can't let the light in. Therefore, when your eye is good, the whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of the lamp gives you light. So Jesus is giving us a spiritual metaphor here, teaching us about light entering in your body. The light needs to be on the inside of the body. The light needs to get in. How does the light get in your body? Well, through the eye, through the teachings of Jesus, through the word of God, and through the presence of God coming in. And so it's saying that when, you're, when your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. But if your whole body is full of light, as when the bright shining of the lamp gives off light, when you have light on the inside, when Jesus is living inside of you, and the presence of God dwells, the Bible tells us our body is a temple. If the body is a temple and there's no God inside of it, on the temple sitting empty. That, that goes for everybody. We're all a temple. We're all designed to have God on the inside. And when you don't have God on the inside, well, it's not a very good temple now, is it? So the light that's on the inside of us needs to shine out for others to see. It becomes evident. And then this teaching about the light and the lamp flows into his teaching about the Pharisee. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. So a Pharisee, hearing Jesus' teaching, invites him to come over for dinner. This seems like a nice thing, but then they start taking issue with Jesus, and it, it turns into an argument of the Pharisee we don't we don't have Pharisees anymore the New Testament's made it a derogatory term and in the time when Jesus lived as a man on the earth the first century there were several political and religious parties within Judaism there were the Sadducees. The Sadducees were upper class priestly families that ruled ruled over Jerusalem. They were most mo many of them were on the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish High Court, and they took care of the temple. And then there was the Pharisees, which was more of a populist movement. They didn't have official roles at the temple, but they were known for being the rabbis of local synagogues. So the Sadducees were usually not called rabbis because they were Levites or priestly people. They were the priests. So 
So the Pharisees were the rabbis that took care of the synagogues. And then there were Essenes, which you don't see a whole lot about them in the New Testament, but they were an ascetic movement that uh, lived out in the desert and were waiting for the end of the world to come. Yeah. The Essenes died off quickly because they were still a bit. So if you don't reproduce, your movement might die. And then there were zealots, which were ones that advocated and were plotting violent overthrow of the Romans. Now, a little bit of history, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD after a zealot uprising. So the zealots were wiped out. It's believed at that time that most of the Essenes were wiped out. With the temple being destroyed, there was nobody needed to take care of it. And so the Sadducees died out and what was left were the Pharisees. So the Pharisees having the synagogue tradition persisted on. And so Judaism from then on was really the Judaism of the Pharisees. And while the rabbis were called Pharisees because of the New Testament and it becoming a pejorative term as well as being divisive with the different factions fighting between themselves at times, between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they dropped the term and simply are called rabbis. Now, some scholars, and this is interesting to think about, but I won't dwell on it too long, with Jesus being called a rabbi several times in the New Testament, he may have himself been a Pharisee, but a dissident Pharisee, disagreeing with many of the rest of them, but the truth is we don't know one way or the other. So a Pharisee invites him to dinner in verse 37. He went and sat down to eat. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. So Jesus is called out on not uh, washing his hands. Washing your hands is a good thing to do, especially now that we understand germ theory. We don't, we don't know why. We don't know if Jesus did this on purpose to provoke them or if maybe he'd washed his hands five minutes before and didn't go to the bowl and make a show of it like they like to do. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who make the outside make the inside also? So, it gives them an analogy here. If you have a cup, would you rather the inside of the cup be dirty or the outside of the cup be dirty? That's, that's pretty easy to say. Of course, we would want, it would matter that the inside of the cup is clean. Not so much of the outside. I mean, think about, that's, what, that's why you have a lid on it. One, so it spills, but two, to keep the dirt and mud out. And think about you're out camping or hunting and the outside of your water bottle gets really dirty. It doesn't really matter if the inside of it's clean. But he, ac he accuses them there and elsewhere worried and worrying about the outside of the dish being clean rather than the inside of the dish. He calls them elsewhere whitewashed sepulchers that meaning the casket's beautiful on the outside, but dead inside. If you ever go to the funeral home, I mean, they have some really beautiful looking coffins out there, don't they? It's like a nice auto body job with chrome handles. And you can appreciate the craftsmanship. You could die in style. Yet, the, in, the inside of it's dead. That's, that's 
That was the point Jesus, is, Jesus was making. So, the outside of the cup and the dish is clean, but the inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did he who made the outside make the inside also? But rather give alms of such things as you have. Then indeed all things are clean to you. Alms giving means giving to charity. So he's talking about giving to charity, such as things you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe the mint and rue and all manners of herbs, and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Jesus is telling them, you don't give alms, you don't give to charity, but yet you tithe the mint and all the minute herbs and spices. You ever grow mint? I've grown mint. It's not a very big plant, and so it's kind of kind of a funny picture that they go and pick their mint, and you have your mint leaves. That's good to cook with them or put them in your lemonade. That's what I like to do with my mint, put them in the lemonade. And so they're just these little little leaves. And so you could picture the Pharisee there counting out nine for me, one for my tithe, Nine for me, one for my tithe of the little tiny leaves. You know, and they're, they're going to bring it to the temple for the Levites. Now, the tithe in that day was a form of tax that went to the temple. It was temple tax. So they're worrying about their mint and their little herb garden and tithing it correctly, but ignoring the weightier master, the weightier matters of justice and the love of God. He says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manners of herbs, but pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Now they, they cared about rule keeping rather than matters of justice and the love of God. We can get caught up in that too. Right? We could be, you know, I, I'm holy, I'm righteous because I don't drink and I don't chew and I don't associate with those who do. But Jesus was calling them out and they're like, okay, you're, you're worrying about some of the little rules that don't matter a whole lot. Yeah, we, we can get, we can easily get caught up in the things that don't matter rather than worrying about and experiencing the love of God. There's a lot of old laws out there that are still on the books places that are funny if you ever read about them. There is a story in England about a student at Cambridge University who entered the classroom for an exam one day and he asked the proctor to bring him cakes and ale. The, the proctor refused expressing astonishment at the young student's audacity to make such a strange request. But at this point, the student read from the 400-year-old laws of Cambridge, which were still written in Latin and somewhat in effect officially. The passage read by the students said, gentlemen sitting for their examinations may request and require cakes and ale. So the proctor was forced to comply, and they didn't have any cakes and ale readily available, but they, they thought Pepsi and hamburgers were judged the modern equivalent. So the necessary accommodations were made to give to the student because, after all, the law was on his side. Three weeks later, after the exam, the student was summoned to the Office of Academic Affairs to face disciplinary action and was assessed a fine of five pounds, which in American money is seven dollars and fifty cents, which was the cost of the meal. Well, he was not fined for demanding cakes and ale, but 
for blatantly disregarding another obscure law that he had failed to wear a sword to his examination. <laughs> So, yeah, that's, that's funny, but Jesus is warning us not, not to get caught up in this. He, he starts with his teaching in verse 34, talking about the eye being spiritual vision, and the eye is good, meaning spiritual health, and that with the light coming in, God's light should shine through you and be seen by all. And then he gives six woes, three to the Pharisees and three to teachers of the law. Verse 42, there we have the first woe. Woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe the mint and rue and all manner of herbs, but pass by justice and the law of God. So the first woe, woe to you because you neglect justice and the love of God. As, as believers and as spiritual people, we should care about justice, as there's a lot of unfair and unjust things going on around us. Yeah, we should stand up for justice. We should fight for it. And the love of God. They neglect the love of God. I mean, how do you be a spiritual person without the love of God? If you don't love God, then what are you doing? What are you doing being a Christian? What are you doing in church if you don't love God? There, there are people in churches that don't. Maybe they're just here for the social aspect because they have friends here. Or maybe they do it to look good. Oh, heck, people become Christians for political reasons to make themselves look good to get elected. But the Pharisees, woe to them because they neglected justice and the love of God. What does woe mean? Woe to you. Sounds Shakespearean to me. What would a modern equivalent be? Shame on you. Might be shame on you because you neglect justice. Shame on you because you neglect the love of God if you do. Then the next, the next one will go to verse, verse 43. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogue and greeting in the marketplace. Woe to you or shame on you because you like the important seats and you like the greetings. For religious leaders, this can still be true. Do we like sitting in the front? Not that there's anything wrong with that. But do we do it? Do we look, do it to look good? Do, do some people do some people do it because they like to be called pastor? Probably. There, there are those still. There are those still out there. I think that there's some people in ministry because this is just my own observation because they love being the center of attention. Uh, not a good reason. They love to hear themselves talk. Oh, you should only be up here if God's called you up here. So Jesus was saying, shame on, shame on you because you love the best seats in the synagogue and the greeting in the marketplace as they love to be called rabbi. The next one, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like graves which are not seen and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Woe to you because you're like unmarked graves. Or shame on you because you're dead inside. What does that mean? You're dead inside spiritually unless you have Jesus in your heart. 
unless you have the love of God and the presence of God in your life. If you just have God and know about God in your head, but not your heart, he's saying that's kind of like being dead inside. If you know about God, but you don't experience God. So those, those for the Pharisees are three traps that any of us can fall into without, without even realizing it. Three things we need to be aware of. Then one of the lawyers, or sometimes answered teachers of the law, answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us as well. What does that mean? One of the teachers of the law or the lawyers was saying, even though not a Pharisee, saying, Jesus, by saying this to them, you're also insulting us. Well, wrong thing to say, because then Jesus had a few insults for them as well. He's saying, Jesus, you're, you're going to offend us too. He's, and Jesus says, in effect, I'm just getting started. And these remind us too, because it's, it seems that people outside the church are always saying that, well, Jesus accepted everybody. Jesus was anything goes. Why? Because he welcomed sinners and tax collectors and ate with them. Of course, but Jesus wasn't always just Mr. Nice. He said to them, Woe to you also lawyers. These were religious lawyers, religious experts, theologians. So it's basically like, shame on you too, theologians. For you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So now he's turned to the teachers of the law, the lawyers, the theologians. Woe to you because you load people with burdens and won't help them. Jesus had called them out many times for having very little hope to sinners. For people that had screwed up, they offered people really no hope of redemption. They weren't willing to help people. It was more of an attitude of they just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get their act together. So he's saying, you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. For the sinners, you put them down because you, you think you're better than they are. You think you're better than everybody else. And you don't do anything to help them get, in the right, get on the right path. Now, a lot of people have been put off by Christianity because maybe you know, Maybe they know somebody who's a Christian and they act judgmental and better than any, everybody else. A lot of people said, you know, I never wanted to go to church, you know, because my aunt or uncle or cousin just, you know, they were a Christian and they acted so much better than we were. And they were always, you know, looking down upon us. And rather than showing us the love of God or doing anything to help, all they seemed to ever do was judge us. People do it. Don't be that family member. Don't be that neighbor. Help people, help people see the light and the love of God. Verse 47. Woe to you, for you build tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In fact, you bear witness that you approve of the deeds of your father. For indeed they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which, which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple, yes, I say to you, it will be required of this generation. So it's woe to you 
because you build tombs for the prophets approving of their debts. Now they were building tombs to the prophets as shrines that they may go and venerate them. And what Jesus was saying, even though you mean to honor them, by building the tomb and by building these monuments to them, you're approving of their death. And thus, by approving of their death, you are responsible for their death. This was, this was a heavy thing to say, but he wasn't just saying it because of that. He was saying that the Lord was sending them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. How is this? It was, in fact, the Jewish leaders that had pressured the Romans to have him crucified. And it was many of them that had the apostles put to death. As we know, Judas, be Judas betrayed Christ. John the, John, the beloved disciple, lived, was the only one to live to a ripe old age and die of natural causes. The rest of them were martyred. So he's saying that he knew what they were going to do, so them causing his own crucifixion and as well as that of prophets and apostles, he was saying, you're going to be guilty of them all from the time of Abel being killed by Cain up, up into the present day. So them building tombs to the prophets, they were thinking like, well, we wouldn't have killed them, yet they're no better than their ancestors in that regard. We have to take the same kind of humility, though. You know, you, you read the Bible and you see people that killed the prophets and persecuted. I mean, even we can read these passages and think, I'm better than the Pharisees, right? They're, they're kind of stupid, aren't they? Well, we have to have the humility to admit that Maybe we're not any better than them. Maybe we can fall into the same trap. Maybe we, maybe we shouldn't judge them too harshly. Then the last woe. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter into it yourself, and those who are entering you hindered. So shame on you because you're taking away the key to knowledge, hindering other people from entering. How? By being a stumbling block to other people, by being in the way of them being able to get to God and knowing the love of God. Shame on you from getting in the way of other people from being able to get to know the love of God. Well, something, something that we can do inadvertently. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. And ultimately they did catch him in things and really when he was crucified, put on trial to be crucified, it was really a blasphemy trial as they were taking issue with him claiming to be the divine son of God, equal with God the Father. And the nail in the coffin was, so to speak, was when he cleansed the temple, the, the final straw there to be able to put him on trial. So his words about them were proving right that, hey, they're responsible for killing the prophets because it was their responsibility for having the Son of God killed. Now, one thing about Pharisees, even in Jewish tradition, in the Jewish Talmud, which is a Jewish teaching, much of it interpreting the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, they named uh, seven types of Pharisees that go hand in hand with Jesus' teaching. One, the shoulder Pharisee. 
and this was written many hundreds of years ago. The shoulder Pharisee. The shoulder Pharisee is one that wears all his good deeds to see by others on his shoulder. The one was all, who was all about doing things to look good. You know, giving money so that they might have a building named after them. Making a big show of bringing their tithes. As Jesus said, praying on the street corner. Rubbing dirt on their face and look, looking dirty so that people could see them fasting. Jesus was saying they've received their reward already because everybody's gotten to see their, their good deeds. The shoulder Pharisee. Number two, the wait a little Pharisee. The wait a little Pharisee is the Pharisee who always finds excuses to put off doing a good deed. Number three, the bruised Pharisee. Now this one's hilarious. The bruised Pharisee is one who runs in the walls and bruises himself because he's always looking down or looking away so that he would not look upon a woman. <laughs> the bruised Pharisee. That's hilarious, isn't it? Like, I'm not going to look at a woman, so I'm going to go around running into things and be full of bruises so that I don't lust. The hunched over Pharisee is number four. But, I mean, Judaism saw their own problem here and wrote it into the Talmud to, so that the Pharisees wouldn't fall into the traps of the Pharisees. The hunched over Pharisees is one that walked around intentionally hunched over to show their humility to others. Yeah, they would be bent over and pretend humility. Um, number five, the ever-reckoning Pharisee. The ever-reckoning Pharisee was always keeping lists to weigh their good deeds versus their bad deeds. And while that might sound funny, a lot of us do the same thing, where I have more good deeds than bad deeds, or I'm not as bad as most people I know. I don't have any fallacy. I don't have any felonies. I've never spent the night in jail. Never been thrown in the back of a cop car. So my, I'm not really that bad. So my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. So that's going to buy me the favor of God and get me into heaven where the Bible says it doesn't work that way. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, that, that, uh, that tells us there are none righteous, no, not one. And that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. It doesn't look that way. That's a trap trying to weigh your good deeds against your bad deeds. Number six, the fearful Pharisee, the Pharisee that has the fear of God in him. Not, not necessarily a bad thing. That's a mixed bag. We're supposed to have the fear of God, the holy God, the righteous God, the Lord sitting on the throne, the creator of heaven and earth, to whom one day every soul will stand before him and give an account. Yeah, we should have the fear of God. But be careful having the fear of God without the love of God. And number seven, the God-loving Pharisee. The Pharisee who loves God from their heart and takes delight in his law. That's... That's the kind of Pharisee we're all supposed to be. I have to believe there were a few good Pharisees out there. They weren't, uh, they weren't all bad, just mostly bad. <laughs> and what we can, and while it's easy to judge the Pharisee, to make fun of the Pharisees, I'll bet if you've been in 
I'll bet if you've been a Christian for a while and part of a church, you could think of at least one or two Pharisees you knew. Maybe they're from a long time ago. Hopefully they're not here. Hopefully it's not me. But they're out there. If you can't think of any, it's probably you. (laughs) But but take take the lesson home of what were the religious people doing wrong according to Jesus? To sum it up, they were they cared about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. They didn't have any inner light to shine forth. They were missing the point, such as justice, loving God, and helping others. They were falling into the trap of looking good, role keeping, acting better than everybody else. Don't fall into those traps. Let's close there. And I just want to invite you, if you're wondering that, you know, boy, I don't, I don't have the relationship of Jesus with Jesus, but I want one. I just want to invite you to come forward and pray with me. Or if you need prayer for anything else or need to get back on track with the Lord, I'll be, I'll be up here to pray with you during the last song or after service. But just want to invite you forward if the Lord's prompting you to come forward.